Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I am well. Happy Friday. <laughs> Happy Friday. Yeah. Good Friday if you yeah. celebrate that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Good Friday. That's right. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Here we go. All right. Get my pen here. All right. Here we go. Ready? I, the, and, to, a, you, of, in, we, it, <clears throat> for, that, is, your, have, will, be, not, are, as, at, this, with, but, on, if, all, so, me, was, very, my, had, our, from, am, regret, paid, question, does, for meet world rest card Sunday end payment special leave read saw statement remain mind six along bring found myself reason around report town following left summer seem interested high either prices Reference used, didn't, probably, coming, general, meeting, show, present. All right, now we're going to do a continuation of different sodas and carbonated drinks. Here we go, ready? Hawaiian punch. Highland Spring, Hires Root Beer, High Spot, Horlicks, Hyper Cow, IBC Root Beer, J20, Jolt Cola, Jewel Must, KDD Chocolate Milk, Kaya Ora, Kinney, Kiwi Cola, Cola Schaller, La Spur, Sparkling Water, Lava Cold Drinks, Lark Spur, Lead, Lemonade, Lilt, Limca, uh, Mad Dog Energy Lemonade, Marengo, Marvel, Masafi, Maxwell House, MDX, Mecca Cola, Mary Mate, Mineral Water, Minute Maid, Mirinda, Monster Energy, Monster Mocha, Mott's, Mountain Dew, Mountain Dew Baja Blast, Mountain Dew Code Red, Mountain Dew Live Wire, Mountain Dew Voltage, Mountain Lightning, Moxie, Mug Root Beer, Nectar, Nes Nestle Cafe, Nest Quick, Nestle Ski Stop Gap 24 7, New Coke, Orangette, Orangina, Ovaltine, Panda Cola, Panda Pops, Peanuts, Pepsi, Pepsi Cola, Pepsi Jazz Black Cherry and Vanilla, Pepsi Jazz Strawberries and Cream, Pepsi Lime, Pepsi Max, Perenna Premier, uh, Pet, PG Tips, Pib Extra, Pineapple, Planet Cola, Pocari Sweat, Pomegranate, uh, Poopius, Pop Cola, uh, Quartero, R Whites, RJ Whites, Raspberry, Red Bull, Red Tornado, Robinson's for Milk, Rockstar, Root Beer, Royal Crown Cherry, Royal Crown Cola, Sam's Choice, Shasta, and Sierra Mist. All right. There's more, but we're going to stop there. All right, let's do some common phrase, or actually they're just short phrases, miscellaneous short sentences. Here we go. All right, here we go. Don't open the door. Plants and flowers, add it up. Answer the phone. We came home. Play it again. Tell the truth. Spell your name. Where are you? You work too much. Three years ago, only a little. 
another great sound, our best things, a good woman, form two lines, read my email, write one sentence, we need more, where does it end, such a mess, it turned out well, hand it over, it's a small world, a different land, tell the truth, because we should, it turned out well. Good things, I think so, even the animals, good and plenty, they went there, show and tell, such a big house, big and small, read the sentence, point it out, I don't feel well, I study hard in school, set it up, it's still there, a small house, turn the page, we want to go too, back off, a little boy, the good American, dad means it, study and learn any old time try your best live and play think before you act it's only me just the same take a little time over the river after the game all right now i'm going to do a um, extension of these legal doublets that we started yesterday actually the day before. Okay, this is going to be an addition to that. Promissory note, contingent estate, bilateral contract, punitive damages, unlawful detainer, default judgment, jury impanelment, commercial paper, executed contract, nominal damages, chattel mortgage, percipient witness, Declar declaratory decree, severance damages, severance pay, adverse possession, summary judgment, constructive notice, original jurisdiction, limited partnership, malice aforethought, bipartite, I'm sorry, let me say that again, bipartite agreement, competent evidence, partition proceeding, appellate jurisdiction, Letters, testamentary, criminal conspiracy, statutory provisions, community property, alternative procedures, practice interest, confidential communication, enforcement proceedings, supporting documentation, mitigating circumstances, ancillary administration, countervailing evidence, Concurrent jurisdiction, indeterminate sentence, comparative negligence, prenuptial agreement, malicious prosecution, preemptory challenge, settlement agreement, unreasonable search. All right. This is going to be the drill that focuses on this, that, these, those. Here we go. This train, these chores, those stores, that room, those days, this horse, these bags, that ball, this foot, supply that, those colors, this control, that trailer, this roster, that expense, push that, those flames, take these, that record, those papers, this problem. Those masters, these faces, this legion, those girls, frame these, hold that, hit these, this chair, see those, those times, sign these, leave this, these boys, those facts, pull this, this table, those shoes, set these, that income, this engine, those lamps, those outlines, this canvas, that enemy, these campers, that system, this poster, that parcel, those comics, these units, this dish, these grills, those pools, that booth, these sticks, this brush, those flocks, that car, ask these, strike that, try these, this book, those kids, that pool, plant these, these tops, see that, that flower, cancel this, carry that. That suspect, forget this, these benefits, those boxes, this lumber, the, these pencils, those gardens, these cabinets, that canopy. Recall that, 
try those, this figure. Ask those, that house, those decks, those trails, watch that, these checks. do some consonant compounds. And uh, this is going to emphasize initial SM, initial SPR, final upper S, and final NDS. Just fade this. All right, here we go. The small boy smelled the smoke. Her smock was smudged. She smiled and smirked at the boy. Cal sprained his ankle on the sprinkler. We spread the sprigs to dry. He sprayed the spruce with water. The wafers come in several flavors. Lee prefers or favors one person. She often refers to the handmade covers and sheets that her mother gave her. On Sundays, he delivers the divers to the shore. The quivers were found in the rivers. Sometimes he offers to fill the coffers. Meg attends all the battle of the band's concerts. Yeah, all the battle, huh? The bonds are included as part of the funds. The winds blew down the stands. Kyle grinds the rinds. He lends his time and tends to the baby. Lisa finds and sends the data to the East Coast. All right, now here are some sentences that um, focus on different numbers. Okay, here we go. During the late 1800s, many Americans migrated to the West. The museum will feature paintings from the 17th century. Most of the inmates were in their late 20s. The child was three years and four months old when he was abducted from the shopping center. In the late 1970s, there was a general awakening of the court systems to the rights of victims. What is your age? Did you say 22? I am 17, which I turned last May. Mrs. Evanrood was in her early 50s at the time of her death. Sheila will be 33 on August the 10th. Many of the cars bought and sold during the late 1950s are still around today. Dina's grandmother is in her late 90s. Several of the exhibits feature items from the 18th century. Are you 21 or 22 years old? During the 20th century, man ventured into outer space for the first time. America was discovered in the 15th century. Right. <clears throat> These are going to focus on final KT endings. So I'm gonna give you the, the um, words first and then I will give you the sentences. Here we go. This pact, this conflict, elect him, will subtract. Our tact does distract, should react, must inject, will convict, does attract, may predict, can retract. Pass out the tract, how will he react? Is it a true fact? The standard is exacting. It is a religious tract. Noise can be distracting. Don't inflict injury. Whom did they elect? That tract is sold out. The die was injected. Resolve the conflict. Has he been evicted? What do you predict now? That fact is not known. The jury will convict him. He signed the pact. The sect is small. It is exacting work. He must retract his story. Have you subtracted? Evict them tomorrow. It is one more fact. Subtract the difference. Inspect the premises. Inject the serum. It will attract the attention. That must be exact. It attracted them. They bought a tract home. He acted accordingly. She reacted quickly. Smog detracted from it. The parts were inspected. It is a tract house. There is a conflict. The convict escaped. He didn't use tact. Subtract the costs. 
How will they act? A reward will attract them. Have you transacted it? The result was predicted. He violated the pact. Can't you be tactful? Cut the exact size. Now we're gonna do some phrases. Here we go. So I have had, so I recall, so I recalled, so I recollect, so I recollected, so I remember, so I remembered, so I shall, so I should, so I understand, so I want, so I wanted, so I was, so much, so you believe, so you believed, so you can, so you could, so you feel, so you felt, so you have, so you have been, so you have had, so you recall, so you recalled, so you recollect, so you recollected, so you remember, so you remembered, so you shall, so you should, so you want, so you wanted, so you were. I didn't believe so, I didn't think so, I don't believe so, I don't think so, you believe so, somebody else, Mr. Speaker, Ms. Speaker, square feet, state your name, state your full name, states exhibit, such as, thank you, that are, that can. All right. Let's go ahead and do some medical words. Here we go, ready? Bloodshot eyes, side view, dental plates, single bone, ascending branch, natural designation, slightly depressed, styloid process, cylindrical shape, longitudinal arch, sensitized film, proper juxtaposition, mechanical contrivances, patient reclines, scar tissue, positive alterations, drawing nourishment, green stick type, fluid secreted, um, glenoid cavity, indirect violence, ambulatory traction. All right. We've got one last drill here, and we're going to move on to literary, okay? All right, this is going to be the um, continuation of different descriptions of automobiles. Um, the, I think the other one's kind of just focused on numbers and initials, but this is kind of more toward automobiles. Okay, here we go. 2006 American Motors, Little Volkswagen Silver. 2007 Nissan Pickup Truck, Green Chevrolet Celebrity 1986, Red 1984 Triumph, Triumph Spitfire Convertible. 1980 Delta 88 Royale, blue in color. 2008 Chevrolet Malibu Classic V6. Toyota Land Cruiser 2016, four-wheel drive. Nissan Pickup, three years old. 2009 Cutlass Cruiser, removable roof. Pale blue Toyota Camry, four-door model. Navy blue Honda Accord, four-door with moonroof, 2015. 1983 Mercury Cougar, license plate 1MEB P92, Mitsubishi Cordia red and white. 1987 Buick Riviera T-Type Turbo V6. 1984 Renault four-wheel drive power steering. 2012 Honda Civic options package. Mercedes-Benz 450SE, seven years old. Scratched and dented, 2009 Chevy Impala. 1986 Mercury, broken headlight. Isuzu Trooper, 1987 diesel engine. 2014 Pontiac V8. 2013 Pontiac C6000 Coupe, dented fender. 1983 Volkswagen Rabbit Convertible, Plymouth Renault, 1984 Automatic, Dark Blue and Gray, 1979 Volvo, four-door model, 
1978 Pontiac Firebird cream colored. Light blue 2012 Cutlass Sierra. 2014 Lincoln Continental. 1980 Green Chevrolet Camaro with racing stripes. 1984 Regency 222 inches long, black in color. Jaguar XJS 2010, red with black interior. All right. Let's go ahead and get started with some literary. And this is on, the subject is agricultural development. Okay, I'm gonna start at 180, but I will work my way to 225. All right, here we go. Ready? In these days of exploration into the atom on one hand and space travel on the other, Anything to do with agriculture probably seems insignificant to most people, yet there is in truth no more romantic page in history than the amazing advance and development of our agricultural production efficiency in the recent decades. The dynamics of agriculture have changed, not only the face, but indeed the very character of America. I understand this is the 84th annual convention of your association. Assuming the meetings have been held each year, this sets the first convention back in the year 1875. Probably few people realize that as many people were employed on the farms of the United States when this association was or held its first convention, as there are now when you are holding your 84th direct employment on farms today is no greater than at the end of the Civil War, even though the population of the country has increased almost 10 times. Moreover, at the end of the First World War, we have reached an acreage of developed cropland, which never since has been exceeded in any significant degree, and probably never will be, on what has been a static cropland base for almost four decades. The national population has increased two-thirds, yet we are now better fed and more abundantly provided with farm products than ever before in our history. My father was born in 1876. He learned to farm with horse-drawn tools. In his youth, the proportion of families engaged in agriculture was one on the farm and one off, in contrast to a proportion of two to one during my grandfather's life. Thus, we have evidence that production per farm family had increased about 50% in one generation. When I was born in 1928, the proportions had changed again to one family on the farm for each two who had lived and worked in an urban environment and development. This came from further production efficiencies in agriculture in the three decades from my father's birth to mine. But all this was only a start. Through the 50 years with which I can sneak with some assurance, the tempo of the change has continued at an increasing rate. From one farm family to each two non-farm families 50 years ago, we now have more than seven non-farm families for each one directly engaged in agriculture. The national population is 88% urban in earning its livelihood and in its way of thinking. This, of course, includes some people who live in the country, although they do not make their livelihood in agriculture. When I was a young boy, the two-mile stretch of country road that I recognized as the home community had 12 families all making their living directly from farming. Today, 14 families live on the same road. All 12 of the original houses are occupied and the two new ones have been built. Only five of these families are now full-time farmers. Two run part-time farms and seven make their livelihood entirely outside of agriculture. Judging from the cars they drive and the appliances in their homes, the neighborhood never before has been so well off. Total production of the farm has doubled in 30 years which means that output per man is now four times as great as it was three decades ago. Every farm that has properly adjusted to the changing technology of agriculture production has made one of the three adjustments. It has expanded onto more acreage for the same labor force, or it has operated much more intensely with the same labor force, 
or it is doing a comparable volume of business with a much reduced labor force. Many combinations of these adjustments are possible and have been used. The farms which have not adjusted will not produce a level of living acceptable to the families now. Commercial farming is less and less a way of life and more and more a way of making a living. It is governed by the same economic dictates that the governed manufacturing or banking or any other process of putting together cost factors to turn out economic products. This does not mean farms are becoming big businesses. They are still family units in and about the same degree, which they have been for generations. However, successful ones are family commercial units instead of family subsistence, subsistence units. They are mechanic, mechanicized and they are turned over as never before. They are specialized, but at an increasing degree. They are capitalized as no other farms have ever been. Such farms operate in a more intimate partnership with the urban industry. And the industry furnishes the tools and the endless array of services without which today's commercial farm operation would quickly grind to a halt. Right. I only got to uh, 200 with that one. Okay, I didn't get to... Um, 225, but I did get to 200. Let's say half of that was 200. Okay, so we're going to do some jury instructions. Um, this one is the continuation of what we've been working on, and I'll start this at 200 and work my way to 225, okay? All right, here we go. Before you may find the defendant guilty of mutilating a corpse as a party to the crime, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant directly committed the crime of mutilating a corpse or intentionally aided and abetted the, abetted the commission of the crime. All 12 jurors do not have to agree whether the defendant directly committed the crime of first degree, mutilating a corpse or aided and abetted the commission of the crime. However, each juror must be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was concerned in the commission of the crime in one of those ways. Mutilating a corpse as defined in section 940.11 of the Criminal Code of Wisconsin is violated by one who mutilates a corpse with intent to conceal a crime or avoid apprehension, prosecution, or conviction for a crime. Before you may find the defendant guilty of this crime, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following two elements were present. Number one, Brian Dorsey mutilated the corpse of Tracy Hall or aided and abetted another in mutilating the corpse of Tracy Hall. Number two, in mutilating the corpse of Tracy Hall or in aiding and abetting another in mutilating her corpse, Brian Hall acted with the intent to conceal the crime. This requires that the defendant acted with the purpose to conceal a crime. You cannot look into a person's mind to find out about the intent. Intent must be found, if found at all, from the defendant's actions, words, and statements, if any, and from all of the facts and circumstances in the case bearing upon the intent. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt at the conclusion of the trial, that Brian Dorsey directly committed both of the elements of this offense, or that Brian Dorsey, Dorsey directly aided and abetted another, aided and abetted another in the commission of the crime, you should find that the defendant is guilty. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. Count three charges that the defendant with first degree sexual assault by use or threat of a dangerous weapon also as a party to a crime. Section 939.05 of the Criminal Code of Wisconsin provides that whoever is concerned in the commission of a crime is a party to that crime and may be convicted of that crime, although the person did not directly commit it. The state contends that the defendant was concerned in the commission of the crime of first degree sexual assault by either directly committing it or by intentionally aiding and abetting the person who directly committed it. The person intentionally aids and abets the commission of a crime, then that person is guilty of a crime as well as the person who directly committed it. Person intentionally aids and abets the commission of a crime when acting with knowledge and belief that another person is committing or intends to commit a crime. He knowingly either assists the person who commits the crime or is ready and willing to assist, and the person who commits the crime knows of the willingness to assist. To intentionally aid and abet the crime of first-degree sexual assault 
the defendant must know that the person is committing or intends to commit the crime of first degree sexual assault and to have the purpose to assist the commission of the crime before you may find that the defendant is guilty of first degree sexual assault as a party to a crime, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant directly committed the crime of first degree sexual assault or intentionally aided and abetted the commission of the crime. All 12 jurors do not have to agree whether the defendant directly committed the crime of first degree sexual assault or aided and abetted the commission of that crime. However, each juror must be convicted or convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was concerned in the commission of the crime in one of those ways. First degree sexual assault as defined in section 940.225 of the Criminal Code of Wisconsin is committed by one who has sexual intercourse with another person without consent and by use or threat of a dangerous weapon. Before you find that the defendant is guilty of this offense, the state must prove by evidence, which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt, that the following three elements were present. Number one, the defendant had sexual intercourse with Tracy Hall. Number two, Tracy Hall did not consent to the sexual intercourse. Number three, the defendant had sexual intercourse with Tracy Hall by use or threat of a dangerous weapon. This requires that the defendant actually used or threatened to use the dangerous weapon to compel Tracy Hall to submit to sexual intercourse. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree sexual assault have been proven, you should find that the defendant is guilty. If you are not so satisfied, you must find that the defendant is not guilty. In reaching your verdict, examine the evidence with care and caution. Act with judgment, reason, and prudence. Defendants are not required to prove their innocence. The law presumes every person charged with the commission of an offense to be innocent. This presumption requires a finding of not guilty unless in your deliberations, you find it is overcome by the evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. The burden of establishing every fact necessary to constitute guilt is upon the state. Before you can return a verdict of guilty, the evidence was, must satisfy the you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. If you can reconcile the evidence upon any reasonable hypothesis consistent with the defendant's innocence, you should do so and return a verdict of not guilty. The term reasonable doubt means a doubt based upon reason and common sense. It is a doubt for which a person can be given, for which a reason can be given, arising from a fair and rational consideration or the evidence or lack of evidence. It means such a doubt as would cause a person of ordinary prudence to pause or hesitate when called upon to act in the most important affairs of life. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt which is based on mere guesswork or speculation. A doubt which arises merely from sympathy or from fear to return a verdict of guilt is not a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt such as may be used to escape the responsibility of a decision. While it is your duty to give the defendant the benefit of every reasonable doubt, you are not to search for doubt, you are to search for the truth. The lawyers will now be making opening statements. The purpose of an opening statement is to give the lawyers an opportunity to tell you what they expect the evidence will show in this case so that you can better understand the evidence as it is introduced during the trial. I must caution you, however, that the opening statements are not evidence. Mr. Kratz, Juror Covington, were you able to hear me when I gave these instructions? All right. Let's do some Q&A. And I read most of that at 225. Started off at 200 and uh, then I picked it up to 225. All right, this is a new transcript. It's a diving accident with a doughboy swimming pool. Okay. And it's going to be plaintiff questioning, it's a depo format. And I will start at 180, okay. And we will work our way to um, 225, there we go. Mr. St. George, I know you have been deposed before. Let me just try to briefly explain. I will ask you some questions. You make sure you hear the question. Make sure you understand the question. If you are not clear, if it is confusing, anything like that, just let me know and I will try to rephrase it or repeat it or have it read back to you so that you will understand it. Is that okay with you? Okay. 
any questions that I ask you, if you go ahead and answer them, I will assume you heard them and understood them in giving the answers, okay? Right, give us your name and address for the record. My name is William Stevens St. George. My address is 2545 Los Lomitas Way, Covina, California. Were you at this meeting on Monday with Mr. Galepsi and some of the other Doughboy people where you prepared for this deposition or talked about the deposition? Yes. Did you receive either at the time or at an earlier time a summary of some sort telling you a little bit about the case? A couple of paragraphs or something? Yes. Did you receive any other materials besides the case summary? I reviewed one of my previous depositions. Was that the one that you gave in August in the Jonathan case to Mr. Gordon? Yes. That's the one everybody else got. Okay. I just assumed that you were treated equally. Did you get that on Monday then at the meeting on Monday? Yes. Have you had a chance to read that? I reviewed it. Did you read it from cover to cover or just look at parts of it? I skimmed it from cover to cover. Well, let me ask you this question. If you feel this is an unfair question or you can't handle it, let me know. I just want to know, is everything that you skimmed in the deposition, I am not sure how you use the word skim, but is there anything in there that you feel wasn't accurately recorded? Something that needs to be clarified or is the information in that deposition pretty much accurate based upon your skimming it? Yes, with the exception of some references in there to SCC, when it should be the SEC, Securities Exchange Commission. Probably a typographical error, yes. Outside of that, it was everything appeared to be basically okay, yeah. I have not read the deposition. I have a summary here that was prepared, but it is a very skimpy summary. Have you ever seen this summary? No, I haven't. You did not prepare this? No. Are you married? Yes. Do you have any children at home? One. And the age? Today is Thursday, so Wednesday. So he is still 11. He turns 12 on Friday. I have an 11-year-old myself. And your date of birth? September 27, 1970. What is your present position at Doughboy? I am the treasurer. Is that the same position you had in August of 2017? Yes, it is. How long have you been the treasurer? Since July of 2009. Is that when you started with Doughboy? No. When did you start with Doughboy? February 15, 2005. And what positions did you hold between 05 and 09? I was controller for Doughboy Recreational Inc. Did you have, approximately a year later, I became the vice president and controller of Doughboy Recreational. Does that cover it? Yes. Prior to 2005, did you work for any other pool companies? No. You don't need to give me every company. What was your basic background before 2005? several years in the public accounting profession, followed by the accounting profession on the private side. Is your basic area finance or accounting or a combination of both? Yes, a combination of both of them. I assume you have some type of degree? Yes. What kind of a degree do you have? BS degree. In what field is that? Major in public accounting. Where would that be from? New York University. And the year approximately? 1994. That was a good year. That is when I graduated. Do you have a CPA? Yes. This CPA, is that something that you get on a state-to-state -state basis or nationwide? It is a state-to-state -state basis. In what state do you have the CPA? New York. Any other states? No. Have you had any further formal education since New York University 94? Some postgraduate work as well as attending a variety of seminars. Would you tell me when and where you learned to swim? What relevance does that have, counsel? Well, this case has to do with the swimming, with swimming in a swimming pool. Certainly his background. What relevance does the fact that the treasure of Doughboy swims or doesn't swim or what he does? It has no relevance to the case. Well, let me ask this question, and maybe it will make it more obvious what the relevance is. 
when did you first learn that spinal cord injuries could occur from the diving accidents at a very young age? Would you tell me what that young age was? Was that before 10, after 10? It would have been before 10. How did you learn that? Specifically, I am not sure. It would have either been from reading or visual, such as I can recall seeing a movie about a young girl that dove into a lake and didn't see an obstruction underwater at the point where she dove. It was shallow water and because of the obstruction, she turned out to be a, I don't know whether it was a quad or a paraplegia. Was the name of that movie Joni by any chance? She is the one that I was familiar with, whether it was that one or not, I don't know. You know who Joni is? Yes. How is it that you remember today so vividly that you learned of this kind of injury from diving before you were 10? I have been swimming since a very early age, having been born across the street from the ocean. I have been told that when they couldn't find me, I was usually across the street. I have always seen pictures of myself in a swimming pool at about the age of about two in Hawaii. Where did you grow up? The United States, all over the country. Well, you said you lived across the street from the ocean. I was born in Long Beach, California. How long did you live in Long Beach then? Oh, I don't know. Well, were you living in Long Beach the first 10 years of your life? No. First five years of your life? No. Less than five years. Less than five. Did you know that because you remember that or because you have been told that? No, I don't remember Long Beach at all, just what I have been told. Pictures you have seen, I take it? Yes. Have you ever taken any swimming training? No. No Red Cross, YMCA, Boy Scouts, no summer camp? Some life-saving courses sponsored by Red Cross. Did you receive a certification in life-saving or lifeguarding? I may have. It was so long ago that I don't remember the certification. Do you remember being taught by any Red Cross courses about spinal cord injuries from diving? Not specifically, no. Do you know when Red Cross first started putting that information into their training programs? No. Have you ever dove? Yes. At what age did you learn to dive? I don't remember. Before 10, after 10? Probably before 10. Did you receive instructions in diving? No. Picked it up by watching other people? Yes. Where would you dive? Would you dive in open bodies of water or pools or both before you were 10, let's say? It would have been an open body of water, but it would have been a protected area, an area that was open to the water, but bulk headed. Where would you dive from? The float anchored out in the deeper water. Did you ever participate in body surfing? Yes. At what age? What period of time did you do that? That is fairly recently after I came back out here to the coast. In the last 10 years, 15 plus. Are you aware of any dangers involved with body surfing? Yes. What are the dangers? If you are not careful, you can get around, you can get grounded into the sand by the waves in the water. You can be a quad like Joni, be, a, be in a wheelchair, is that right? Yes. Are you nodding your head yes? Yes. Why do you go ahead and body surf knowing that that can occur? If you exercise caution to prevent that kind of an accident, what is caution? What caution do you exercise? Usually it is in deeper water. How deep would that be? At least chest high in the trough of the wave. When you say chest high, are you talking chest high of yourself? Yes. How tall or high are you? I'm about 5'11". Chest high would be a little over four feet on you. It would probably be four and a half feet. Have you ever body surfed in water that was less deep than that? I don't think so. Have you ever seen anybody or any other people body surf in water less deep than that? Probably, I have seen some people also come up very scraped up from being against the sand, against the sand. What part of the body did you notice the scrapes on? The chest. What about the head? Oh, I don't remember specifically the head. Have you ever had occasion to go up and tell some of these other people, body surfing in water less deep than yours, that they can break their neck and be in a wheelchair forever? No, I never did that. The body surfing you have done has been out here in California, the California coast, I assume. Correct. What beaches would you have brought body surfed on? I don't know, Pismo, Huntington, and I am not sure how to spell this other one. It was Carrillo, C-R-R-I-L-L-O. Any others? 
probably, but those are the ones that come to my mind that we spend vacation time in both of those areas. Are you familiar with the operations wipeout out of Hogue Hospital out of Newport Beach? No. Are you familiar with, well, what some people consider to be a famous Newport Beach diving case, the $6.6 .6 million? I have heard of it, yes. Have you ever considered the possibility that when you were in the ocean body, surfing in chest high water, that other people might see your body surfing and attempt to imitate what you were doing, not knowing what you know about being injured? That might occur. I hadn't particularly thought about it. Have you ever body surfed on any of the East Coast? Not that I can recollect. What about diving into the waves? Have you ever engaged in diving into the waves? Probably. I mean, you know, you are risking it from doing that too, right? If you dive down, if you don't dive properly, and how do you dive properly to avoid that occurring? You are diving into the wave. You are going through the wave instead of down into it. Is there any requirement that you have as far as depth is concerned in diving into the waves? You use your common sense. What is common sense to you? You evaluate the risk that you are willing to take versus the risk that is there. Well, how does that come into play in the depth? I mean, how does that tell you how deep the water should be before you attempt to dive into the wave? I have never done that. Maybe I am asking stupid questions. I assume that you get the waves or a different height when you dive. Yes. Where do you choose the wave that you want, the height that you want, let's say if it is possible? Well, I suspect that I don't do it when the water is ankle high. What about waist high? Possibly, probably nothing less than that, but diving through the wave, you are going to be on top of the water when you come out of the other side of the wave. As I said, I haven't done any of those things, so you have got to forgive my ignorance. When you do the body surfing, my understanding is that you try to get up on top of the wave and sort of ride through it, such as if you were on a surfboard, is that right? Yes, if you do body surfing in chest high water, as you told me, at some point as you were riding the wave, the water is going to get more shallow? Yes. How do you avoid getting hurt when you get to the more shallow water on a body surf maneuver? Having come through a particular area, I become familiar with the area that you are going into. When you reach a certain point, you put your feet down. How do you know where that point is? If you are trying to explain to me how to do it so I wouldn't get hurt, where could you tell me to put my feet down? Run that one past me again. Council, what is all of this about diving into the ocean? I think it is totally irrelevant. If you want, I think, if you want to educate yourself on surfing, I guess that you should conduct your discussions outside of the confines of this deposition or go online and do your own, your own research later. This has nothing to do with this case. It is totally irrelevant. I have allowed you to go on and on because sometimes it is easier to let you ask these irrelevant questions than it is to terminate it but you have gone on far enough, so stop it. You are telling him not to answer the question? Yes, I am. Okay, Mr. St. George, isn't it true that the same basic concepts that you learned in the ocean that you engaged in in the last 15 years in body surfing and diving into the waves, the same basic concepts of how you do it and how you avoid injury and knowing that you can be injured apply to the diving into above ground pools? I don't dive into above ground pools. No, but I mean, if you dive into an above ground pool, you know that the same thing would happen to you that could happen to you from the body surfing or diving into the waves. Is that right? Sure, because it is a shallow body of water. Don't you think that there might be some people in the United States that feel the same way that you do about the ocean, that because they are familiar with it and because they know how to dive, that they can dive into an above ground pool without getting hurt? possibly. I mean, that's the way you feel about the ocean, right? You feel you know how to do it. You realize that there is a little risk, but you take the risk because you know how to do it. Is that right? Yes. But in your opinion, people think that way as it relates to the above ground pools think wrong because it should be not be done. You should not dive into an above ground pool, correct? Under any circumstances, the pool, at least our pool is not designed for diving purposes. Are you aware of any above ground pool made in the last five or six years that is made for diving? Not particularly, no, but then I am not familiar with every, every above ground manufacturer's product. Have you worked for Doughboy? And I am sure I am getting to know the different people that have been there and some of the history of Doughboy. 
Have you become aware of the fact that back in the early 90s, at least Doughboy, along with all of the other above ground pool industry people, were advertising these same above ground pools as diving pools? It is my understanding that that was an entirely different product. How was it different? I don't know. I am not a technical. Who told you that it was a different product? And how do you know it was different? Well, people that were in the industry at the time, did they tell you how it was different? No. Didn't you wonder how it was different? Not particularly. At your deposition before, have you seen any of the ads back in the early 90s showing people diving above the in the above ground pools? Cartoon character type ads, yes. You don't remember seeing, for example, the Silver Line or Ocean Line series where they show a diving board into an above ground pool? You don't remember seeing that at all? Yeah, I think I recall seeing something. I am sure I did see that, but probably before I even got out of college. From the ones you remember seeing at your depositions, would you tell me what you remember seeing about those that makes them different than the pools you sell today? As far as the pools are concerned, exactly. I have no, I am not familiar with those products. You saw the pictures I am asking, looking at the pictures, what did you see in the pictures that looked different, if anything? Not a lot. And do you remember seeing some of the advertising back in the early 90s? Advertising pools as having a deep, Diving area? No. You don't remember that? Uh-uh. Do you know what the origin of the deeper part of the pool is, the variable depth part, or the hopper part, or whatever you want to call it? Do you know why Doughboy started making a deeper area to their pools? No. When you were doing your diving in the waves or the body surfing, did you ever have an occasion where you struck the bottom yourself? You told me about seeing other people do it. I wonder if you ever did. Not to the point where I got physical injury, scratched up, or anything. I take it you may have touched the bottom. I have gotten my trunks full of sand before, but no visual injuries, no injuries. Okay, do you have any idea how much force it takes to break the spine in the neck area and cause spinal cord injury? No. You have no idea how hard you have to hit the bottom of an above-ground pool, for example, to break your neck? I know. Whether it is above ground pool or whether it is something else, it is not a lot of force. How do you know that? Because I have killed rabbits by breaking their neck. I have seen that done myself. Let me ask you, is there anything that I could tell you or how or show you today that would convince you that what you are doing in body surfing and diving into the waves is not safe because you could get hurt? You know, I am going to object to this. Don't answer that question. Well, along the same lines, do you have any opinion or thoughts today as to what could be said to people that we have talked about that dive into above ground pools on the same basis, believing that they know how to dive in, that they will not get hurt? Do you have any ideas as to what you could do or say to those people to convince them that they were wrong? Again, you are asking this witness to testify as an expert on what people say to people that are using pools. This man is a treasure of a corporation. He has nothing to do with any of the questions that you have posed to him. He couldn't answer these questions any more than anyone else that you pulled right off of the street. The purpose of this deposition is to discover facts relating to this particular case. You are asking this witness to act as an expert witness on one hand, and on the other, you are prying into his personal life, and none of it has anything to do with the issues in the case. If you don't get onto the facts related to the case, I am going to terminate the deposition. It is your privilege. Are you telling him not to answer the question? Yes, I am. Well, do you claim to be an expert in anything that has to do with this case? No. Now, the only reason I'm asking all of these things, like I said, I haven't read your depo from Jonathan. I am just looking at this outline that was supplied to me from the defense counsel. I get the impression in this outline that you have expressed opinions previously to the fact that everybody should know better than to dive into above ground pools. I guess if you are not an expert in anything having to do with this case, that would be something that you shouldn't or wouldn't be able to render an opinion on. I can render an opinion, but it is not a factual. I am not expressing a factual. Well, in my mind, I guess it is a fine line where you draw the line as to whether you are an expert and whether you are not an expert. In my opinion, you are not an expert in anything that has to do with this case. You are not an expert in knowing whether it is common sense or common knowledge that people know better not to dive into above ground pools. I am just going to assume that that is the way it is and get off this line of questioning and shorten the depot up a lot. Just to make sure I am clear, you don't claim to have any special knowledge or ability in the form of expertise as far as it relates to warning signs, how to prevent people from diving into above ground pools. 
No. Do you have anything at all to do in your position or your prior positions with keeping track of the lawsuits that are brought against Doughboy from the people that get hurt on those pools? That's under, that's done under, I suppose, my area of responsibility. Would you explain that a little further? Well, relating to the purchase of insurance, liability insurance, typically the insurance carriers will want to know a history of lawsuits, so we provide that for them. So I take it you have a list somewhere in your department of all of the prior litigations against Doughboy, you know, as to the number of cases and some background information of what they are about, something like that. Yes, a lot of the companies, they keep what they call litigation files. Does that mean anything to you? Yes, it does. Do you keep the litigation files in your department somewhere? We keep it in a department there, yes. Is there a particular person in your department that is in charge of the responsibility of taking care of custody and keeping the litigation files up to date? Yes, who would that be? That would be Mrs. Jackie Leo. Jackie Leo, L-E-O, correct. How long has she been there? I think she joined the company shortly after I did, I guess. She has been there a while, approximately eight, I don't remember specifically her hire date. Out of that time, how long has she been in charge of the litigation files that we have talked about in the whole time or less than that? The whole time, the whole time. Does she have a title there? What would her position or title be? Yes, she does, but I don't recall what it, what it is offhand. Does she have any other responsibilities other than taking care of the litigation files or is that a full-time job for her? Today, she no longer has any additional responsibilities. At some point in time, I take it it was not a full-time position, correct, but it has grown to that length at today's time, correct. Does she have any particular kind of legal background or paralegal background or anything like that, or did she sort of pick this job up as she worked along? She picked it up as she worked along. I take it if you needed information for the insurance company, she would be the one you would call upon to assist you in deriving whatever information you needed as far as litigation was concerned. Yes, that is correct. I think we filed some requests to admit in this case, as well as a couple of other Doughboy cases about prior litigation. Do you know what a request to admit is? Yes, I do. And did anybody show you any of those requests to admit as far as prior litigation against Doughboy? Yes. Did you sign the answers, do you recall? I am not sure. Let's see if I can find it. Well, in looking in my file, I don't. We are all human. We all make mistakes looking in my files. I can't find any answers in my file to that set of questions. Hold on, this is on the Bean case. Why is the Bean case in here? Sorry about that. Do you remember specifically reviewing in this particular case, the Reach case, the request to admit regarding prior Doughboy litigation? I don't have a specific recollection that relates to this case. If I took a list of all the cases that I have by name, prior Doughboy litigation cases, and went down, the list, you would be able to tell me the background of those cases from memory? Probably not. All right, so we'll stop there, do a page of read back. So most of that time was at 225. All right, so this is going to be defense. And the first time, I'll read it at 225 and then 200 and then 180. Here we go. Maybe I am not clear. As you were coming up the stairs, you say that the stairs made a turn. Was there a landing? There was originally a first landing. There is a first landing and then the stairs made a turn? Yes. Is there a place to get off at that landing? No, there isn't. The stairs just make a junction, a junction. At the first landing that you got to, were the people coming down at that landing? No. Would you describe what happens when you get to the second floor level? Is there a landing there or is it an immediate entry to the room? Tell us as best you can just how the staircase looks at the second floor. There is a landing there and then you make a right-hand turn. Then there is a doorway immediately there on the landing. How big a landing is this? Four foot square or a little bit bigger than four foot square, probably two yards by two yards. And in just a little square area, as you come out of the door, you make a turn and go down the stairs, go down the stairs. Is there a railing on that? No, there are walls. There are walls, walls on both sides of the stairway. Where did you see these three people? On the top landing as they had just exited the doorway. 
you saw them exiting the doorway. That is where they ran into us. And then you entered the room. You could see almost the entire room right from the landing. You got the three that you observed exiting the room as they came down the stairs and you entered the room and you saw the rest within the room, correct. Okay, let's do it again at 200. Maybe I am not clear. As you were coming up the stairs, you say that the stairs made a turn. Was there a landing? There was originally a first landing. There is a first landing and then the stairs made a turn? Yes. Is there a place to get off at that landing? No, there isn't. The stairs just make a junction, a junction. At the first landing that you got to, were the people coming down at that landing? No. Would you describe what happens when you get to the second floor level? Is there a landing there? Or is it an immediate entry to the room? Tell us as best you can just how the staircase looks at the second floor. There is a landing there and then you make a right hand turn. Then there is a doorway immediately there on the landing. How big a landing is this? Four foot square or a little bit bigger than four foot square, probably two yards by two yards. And in just a little square area, as you come out of the door, you make a turn and go down the stairs, go down the stairs. Is there a railing on that? No, there are walls. There are walls, walls on both sides of the stairway. Where did you see these three people? On the top landing as they had just exited the doorway. You saw them exiting the doorway. That is where they ran into us. And then you entered the room. You could see almost the entire room right from the landing. You got the three that you observed exiting the room as they came down the stairs and you entered the room and you saw the rest within the room. Correct. All right, last time at 180. Here we go. Maybe I am not clear. As you were coming up the stairs, you say that the stairs made a turn. Was there a landing? There was originally a first landing. There is a first landing and then the stairs made a turn? Yes. Is there a place to get off at that landing? No, there isn't. The stairs just make a junction, a junction. At the first landing that you got to, were the people coming down at that landing? No. Would you describe what happens when you get to the second floor level? Is there a landing there? Or is it an immediate entry to the room? Tell us as best you can, just how the staircase looks at the second floor. There is a landing there, and then you make a right hand turn. Then there is a doorway immediately there on the landing. How big a landing is this? Four foot square or a little bit bigger than four foot square, probably two yards by two yards. And in just a little square area, as you come out of the door, you make a turn and go down the stairs, go down the stairs. Is there a railing on that? No, there are walls. There are walls, walls on both sides of the stairway. Where did you see these three people? On the top landing as they had just exited the doorway. You saw them exiting the doorway. That is where they ran into us and then you entered the room. You could see almost the entire room right from the landing. You got the three that you observed exiting the room as they came down the stairs and you entered the room and you saw the rest within the room. Correct. All right, how is that? I got all of the 180 take. <laughs> Good. Does the 180 seem slow after the? Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was like, my notes are good, I'm yeah. sure. That's great. But I struggled with the first take, the 225. So I can make it easy on myself and just read the 180. <laughs> there you go. I don't know. How was the 200 take? Um, it was good. I, I think it's good. I don't know. I don't remember. 
it's like, yeah, <laughs> it leaves my brain as soon as it's over. That's okay. That's all right. All right. Well, if you want, I can start. Just let me know. Yeah. What I'm just trying to decide which one to read. <laughs> do I, do I want to try to figure No, I'll do my 180. Why not? All right. <laughs> I'm ready. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Question, maybe I am not clear. As you were coming up the stairs, you say that the stairs made a turn. Was there a landing? Answer, there was originally a first landing. Question, there is a first landing and then the stairs made a turn? Answer, yes. Perfect. Question, is there a place to get off at that landing? Answer, no, there isn't. Question, the stairs just make a junction? Answer, a junction. Question, at the first landing that you got to, were the people coming down at that landing? Answer, no. Question, would you describe what happens when you get to the second floor level? Is there a landing there or is it an immediate entry to the room? Tell us as best you can just how the staircase looks at the second floor. Answer, there is a landing there and then you make a right hand turn. Then there is a doorway immediately there on the landing. Awesome. Question, how big a landing is this? Answer, four foot square or a little bit bigger than four foot square. Probably two yards by two yards. Question. And is this just a little square area as you come out of the door, you make a turn and go down, down the stairs? Answer, go down the stairs. Question, is there a railing on that? Answer, no, there are walls. Question, there are walls? Answer, walls on both sides of the stairway. Question, where did you see these three people? Question, I'm sorry, answer on the top landing as they had just exited the doorway. Question, you saw them exiting the doorway? Answer, that is where they ran into us. Question, and then you entered the room? Answer, you could see almost the entire room right from the landing. Question, you got the three that you observed exiting the room as they came down the stairs and you entered the room and you saw the rest within the room? Answer, correct. Awesome job. Great job. Well, are you gonna do anything for Easter? Um, going to church and then um, go, we're going to the early service and then we're gonna have breakfast with my mother-in-law after that and then we're going over to my aunt's house and they're barbecuing later in the day and I always do some kind of game every year so I'm in charge of the games always <laughs> in my family so that's I'm awesome a something yeah we, we usually do a, an egg hunt and everyone can play kids and adults and then it's like but I'm doing something a little different this year but we always have fun so that's awesome yeah I love, that. I love games so that's cool that you're in charge of the game <laughs> i always am i all i the only thing about it is i never i hardly ever get to play the games because i usually am in charge of the games and i put together games where i can't play or because i yeah. know the answers or whatever but yeah that's so, so awesome yeah we're big i'm big into games <laughs> so am i um, and this is a different kind of game, board game, but do, have you ever played Sequence? Yeah. Uh-huh. That's my favorite game. Is it? Yeah, I haven't played that in a long time. We used to play that um, when I was young a lot. 
I love yeah, we that would, game. Yeah, that's Every a, that's a good one. Every time we get together with my friends, I'm like, can we play sequence? They're like, really, Jill? Can we <laughs> play? I'm such a creature. I have it. <laughs> they want to play all the new ones. I'm like, no, let's play sequence. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, that's a good game. Yeah. Oh my gosh, was, I, don't, I need to get that game. I actually don't have it anymore, but that's a fun one. Yeah, my my husband and I, we like our friends. We get when we get together. That's what we do. We play games. So I'm like, I love it because I didn't really have a group of friends that played games, but my husband, when I met him, he did, and I was like, yes, I married into <laughs> a group of people that love games. That's awesome. Are you competitive? Yeah. I am too. My husband always says, I don't want to be on your team. <laughs> I'm super competitive, but I've learned to like, in certain settings, depending on the people, I can tone it down. Like, yes. yes. <laughs> Cause I'm like, I'm really into the rules too. And uh, some people aren't. And no, like, doesn't that I, drive you crazy? It drives me nuts. But his friend, my husband's friends are all into the rules. They're like perfect game a perfect game group. Yeah. So, um, anyways, we, yeah, we play all kinds of games. We play the new games and some old games. So that's awesome. But yeah, that's we're, I, I grew up my immediate family. We played games a lot. So it's like in my blood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. I love, I love playing games too. It was fun. We got together with some friends around Valentine's day and my one friend said, let's play like the, kind of like a, it, it was kind of like the newlywed game, but you know, we've all been married for a long time, but she, it was really cool how she did it. Cause she had like section A, you had to pick one question and they were all worth different points, you know, some were easy and some were hard. So you wanted to go for a harder question and take your chance and you're going to get more points. But it was so cool. Cause we had to like, write down like what we would, you know, what we thought the answer was and then, you know, not show it to anybody. And then we went around the room and like held up our, you know, answers. And it was so cool because the, the couple that won, it, it's through like our Bible study group, but the couple that won have been married for like 35 years. And it's like, that's so uh -huh. cool because it just goes to show like they just know each other, you know, they got, I think they got every question right. And, and it, some of them were hard. Some of them were not easy, you know? How fun. That would be fun to yeah, it was so much to fun. play. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. How fun. So, yeah. So I, I, I just loved it. What are you doing? So, huh? Oh yeah. What are you doing for Easter? Just going to the same thing, just going to church in the morning and then going to my sister's house and, um, you know, just, uh, seeing all of our family having a barbecue and, I was bummed because my daughter was going to come down this, she has spring break next week, you know, cause she's a school teacher. And so mm -hmm. she's coming down this week, but she got chosen for a jury last week. So she's on a jury. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, So she can't come down because she has to be back on Monday. I, I think they said Monday will be the last day. So she'll still come down next week, but she just can't come on, you know, it's a six hour drive. So she's yeah down and you know they the the court is the courthouse is closed today so um they said well you guys will have to come back on monday and i think it'll wrap up because she was on the jury all last week so anyways but she keeps saying hi mom it's so fascinating and i'm watching the court reporter and <laughs> it's, you know just kind of need for her to see that side of it because she's never had to serve before you know uh-huh so it was yeah fascinated with it but well that's cool but too bad that she can't come down bummer I know the timing I know. I know it's such a bummer so anyways it's we'll celebrate with her next week we'll get together and do something you know yeah are you gonna get to see your um your son and, and yeah. your little your little grand what's her name granddaughter her name is Paisley. Oh, Paisley. That's right. Little Paisley. Yes. yes. I'll get to see her. Yes. I can't wait. Aw. I cannot wait. I'm so excited. So oh, fun. I know. Cause it, it, you know, as, as if I don't see her, like after like five days, I'm like, Oh, I need to see her, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. 
Yeah. So, and I was gone last week, last weekend and, uh, with my roller derby team and they came over here to see my husband. He called me. He's like, guess who's here. So, oh man. I'm, like, oh, I'm dying. I can't wait to see you. <laughs> so. Oh, we'll have fun. Yes, that sounds you nice. too. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. I'll see you next week. Okay. See you okay. next week. Okay. Bye. Bye.